Welcome in everybody to Fantasy Pros. This is the Fantasy Baseball Podcast. It is me, Joey P. Joe P. Zafia. And today we've got another all-star team for you. Today it's the all-sleeper team for 2024. Get excited, everybody. It's me. It's the Welsh. It's you. And everybody has a different definition of sleeper. And to me, Welsh... When I think about sleepers, I just think about guys who are being undervalued. And sometimes it's young players, but sometimes it's also veterans who continue to produce and yet still nobody wants them because they're another year older. But sometimes these veterans can continue to be steady, productive players in your fantasy lineup. Do you have a definition of sleeper before we kick things off with our all sleeper team of 2024? Yeah, it's it's kind of like because there's breakouts and there's sleepers and rebounds and blah, blah, blah. They're they're, they're all... uh... Um, in the same family. So sleepers in my mind are players that are being talked about less than like, cause we just did the breakouts episode and that right. episode is designed. These players are ready to take this next step and they're usually not like at the higher level. I do think sleepers can still be like, there could be a guy that's ranked like 50. If I think he can be uh, the first overall player, Michael Harris, My, uh, Michael Harris isn't a sleeper technically, no, but in the can't de- be a sleeper in the first. No, no. But in my picks. definition of like, if that's a guy that's like a third rounder that I can be a first rounder, like that's kind of that undervalued. So it comes back to your undervalued conversation. My definition in this episode is players that get talked about less because the community is so much bigger there's so many more people and voices it's hard to find sleepers and deeper so i'm Mm -hmm. playing these deeper names because i do believe there's handfuls of players that are still in the top 100 that are sleepers by being undervalued but these are much further down these are further down guys we're sleeping on that in some cases aren't really being drafted that could then end up jumping in and being valuable starters across the board. So I will kind of join you in all of all that stupid crap I just said in that it's like, it's undervalued. These are undervalued players. Under discussed, um, I think is the key for you. I like when you said under discussed, because I think, you know, there's certain guys we've talked about so much. You know, we've talked about the Reagans and the Michael Kings and the Camineros. Like we've talked about those guys and we love those guys. But I think it's important to start to give some love to some players that nobody's talking about or maybe people are tired of talking about or even worse, take for granted. And I'm looking at it just so happens all of mine are ADPs outside of the top 200, save one who's at 199 currently. Mm. So I'm talking about guys that are buried. I'm talking about this is towards the end of your drafts. So, again, for sleepers. It's a mixture for me, and I'm going to start here with our catcher. And for me, it's Mitch Garver, who I don't think people are paying enough attention to. Now, when you look at fan graphs, he is slated to hit four in this lineup. He qualifies at catcher, but he's also going to DH. So you're going to get more at-bats out of Mitch Garver. Mitch Garver last year had a pretty solid season. Uh, He's still going to give you power, which I think that's something that is uh, forgotten too much. If you're in deeper leagues and you're looking for somebody with RBI potential, somebody with power potential, or in the two-catcher league, Mitch Garver becomes really intriguing. He is right now currently the 15th catcher going off the board. And Welsh, I don't think we're taking enough into account his position in the batting order, which means so much. He's got Jorge Polanco and Julio Rodriguez hitting in front of him. Those guys are going to be on base. He's going to have RBI opportunities. I think Mitch Garver is one of these guys that you could take as a deeper league utility guy. I think he's a great bench bat. I think he's a great, you know, deeper league catcher or a two catcher league. Mitch Garver is somebody you should pay attention to because, like I said, he is going to qualify there and he's going to get at bats in the middle of that Seattle order. And I think Seattle is going to be uh, challenging for that West this year. They're my pick to win it. I know that's not always the popular pick. But I think from the board right now on the betting side, it's a really intriguing one. Who is your catcher that you think is on your all sleeper team this year? Yeah, I want to point out, um, I probably would have picked Garver here uh-huh. because of all the, posi- I'll, I'll also say all the positions that we're going to talk about. I do think the line between breakout and sleeper and like favorite player to draft, they're really close in this because as I've said to a lot of people, I like late catchers I, I i don't i don't want any of the guys on the top end so could i have put gabby moreno here yeah i put him in the all breakout team because i think he's going to take a next step one of your guys logan ohapi i could have put him here as well garver well, i think break out because i think he showed you enough last year where you're like okay you give this guy 100 and you know 25 games he's gonna hit 30 home runs like that's a breakout guy but he's also garver- a sleeper 
at catcher 14. He can be. You're right. Yeah. At sleeper, at, at catcher, he's still technically um, a sleeper as well. But you've got yeah. another name on this list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I was just kind of lining all those up because I think the line is very thin. The guy that I picked is the ninth ADP catcher. So it's not too, too far down there. It's Wilson Contreras. And one of the reasons behind putting Wilson Contreras there is constant 20 three straight seasons now he has put up at least 20 homers gets a handful of stolen bases batting average has actually ticked up over the last three years i think that cardinal team is gonna kind of rock back out this uh this coming year his xba was the highest of his career this past year 279 versus his 264 batting average Hard hit numbers are pretty solid, almost 47% hard hit. Baseball savant, you go and look outside of his chase rate, you're kind of top 20 percentile and X woba X slugging in a really good offensive lineup that I think you like I said, Arenado Goldie are gonna have a bounce back. And at catcher nine, really the the sleeper aspect of this is I don't think anybody talks about him. People talk more about his brother. People focus on the top end. I think Contreras can easily be a top five closer or catcher. So I think he definitely defines the high-end offensive upside that I want from catcher. So Gabby Moreno breaks out. Ohapi breaks out. Garver is killer, but Contreras can be a top five catcher easy with those offensive stats. And that is why we are sleeping on him and he's my all catcher sleeper. All right. Who are we sleeping on at first base, Welsh? Because your name is somebody that I just took in our underdog draft. Uh, I think with all the new rookies, we're kind of leaving him out. Uh, of a lot of discussions. So let's talk about your selection. Yeah. So you were saying like all your sleepers are outside the top 200. Contreras is technically because of the NFPC. I have two other players that are inside the top 200 that I'm designing as sleepers. This is one of them. Christian Encarnacion Strand. Huge hard hit mm -hmm. numbers this past year. Uh, average 111, almost essentially 112 EV, which is killer. Over 10% barrel rate, which is great. Almost a 50% hard hit rate, which is phenomenal, 48.4%. And let's go back to the uh, batting average stuff. His expected batting average, XBA, it was the same as his batting average, which was 270. So there's strikeout issues, but what does he do in my book? Hits the ball really hard. He also barrels the ball. He gets it in the air. And now he's got more opportunity with the Noel V. Marte situation in yep. the best hitting ballpark in baseball best ballpark factors so now we're less worried about any weird playing time stuff he's going to be handed this first base job so why is he a sleeper because he is being massively undervalued which could have been a big piece because of this weird situation with too many players and this might start to change but at 157 and adp the 19th first baseman on the fantasy pros adp He's a sleeper. He's a top 100 bat. Christian Encarnacion Strand. I love Tristan Casas. He's my all breakout team, mm -hmm. my all whatever. I want every share of him. Strand could put up top 10 catcher numbers this year, and he's almost going into the pitcher. 20s. I mean, uh, first base numbers, you mean? First base numbers. Oh, yeah, yeah, first base. I'm catcher, closer. I'm you tried to have a catcher here. close, and now you're like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well. Catcher closer catch. is a, uh, it's an enunciation thing between I screwed up all the time. I don't know how I turned him into a catcher. The good thing is he's got a position. It's first base. Yeah. Those power numbers are real, and there's a 30 home run potential uh, with Cincinnati with all of that playing time. So I think Strand, we, uh, we have been sleeping on him, and and we might not be so sleepy anymore because of the uh, Noel V. Marte situation, but he's my pick for the all sleeper first baseman. Uh, I've got one from Cincinnati. And also, you know, if you watched the show last week, we did the breakout team and I was talking about Michael Garcia at third, but I was also talking about Noel V. Marte. That was my main guy. And of course, the PD suspension came like hours later after we finished that show, of course. But because of that same suspension, I've got another guy in Cincinnati who he's going to get more playing time for sure. Now it's Jimer Candelario uh, of the Cincinnati Reds last year, coming off a season where he had 22 homers, 70 RBI, 70 runs. You say, OK, well, that's not really exciting. But you know what? It's exciting enough when you're hitting in the middle of his order in a good offensive ballpark on a good offensive team. And in those mixed leagues, in those deeper leagues where you're looking for help in your corner spots, he qualifies at first, he qualifies at third. The dual eligibility is great. I'm putting him here at first base on this team because, again, middle of the order. I keep coming back to how important lineup placement is in fantasy. And right now, Strand is looking like he could be hitting eighth, according to fan graphs. That's where he's projected. Sure. Candelario hitting cleanup right now. Now, that could flip-flop by May. 
But at the same time, I think you have to pay attention to Candelaria. He is a player that I don't think gets enough credit. Another guy, too, he qualifies at second base. He qualifies a couple of places. It's Brandon Drury of the Los Angeles Angels. He is the 22nd second baseman going off the board, 220 in ADP currently. And this is another one, Welsh. I just don't get it. Uh, I keep looking around and I keep saying to myself, why does no one want Brandon Drury? Qualifies at first, qualifies at second. Two straight years of 26 or more homers, 28 homers in 2022, 26 last year. Again, I understand the, the runs and RBI fell short a little bit, um, maybe of expectations, especially the runs last year down from 87 to 67, but he's still at 260 in both of those. I'm looking at just the profile of this player, and I think because people are so sour on the Angels, and rightfully so, that his ADP has been suppressed further than it should be, because if you're just talking about a projectability of a 20-80-80 player, and that's what he is with a 260 batting average, I think that's better than 220 ADP. I just think that's far more valuable. You know who the player is. I understand that first year, maybe you weren't buying all the power, you weren't buying everything, but when he basically repeated it year over year... What do you have to lose with this player? Nothing. I don't think we've done one show where we talked about him. I've started drafting him. I drafted him in the Raz Slam. I drafted him in a couple other best ball situations. Uh, we just did the underdog draft. I drafted him there too. He's going late. He's got pop. He's got at bats. To me, this is another player that I'm going to lock in. In terms of batting order also, that's another thing where, okay, where is he going to hit in the order? We know Trout's going to be, you know, towards the top of the order. But right now, he is slated to hit sixth in this batting order. That's a good situation there. Uh, Anthony Rendon is never healthy, so he could easily flip into that four or five spot without a doubt. So that's my guy at second base. Who's your second baseman? I'm going to stay with it. It was funny. I actually had a big old smile when you uh, when you put uh, Drury on here and you said Drury because I'm going on that other side with Luis Ringifo as a super, super deep sleeper here. 266 ADP right now. As far as second base goes, he's ranked 28th on the Fantasy Pros ADP when you look at it. Now, numbers last year, pretty solid. He's in, he increases barrel percentage, career high barrel percentage into the sevens. His uh, hard hit rate continues to tick up. It was actually a career high 36.9%. But the guy at least sits around that 250 batting average marker, does not strike out a whole bunch. We've seen some power, 17 and 16 homers respectively. He's also hit the same batting average two straight years, but the talking about him leading off, and that's something that I really, no pun intended to our show, that's something that I really like if he's going to be able to lead off, even if it's in a split situation, if it's like him and then uh, Shanwell, if, if they're going to go back between that, it's going to create run opportunities. Everything that you just said about Brandon Jury lives with Ringifo as well. He's probably going to score more runs than he is RBI. Batting average, anywhere from the 250 to 270 range. He's going to steal some bases. We might get into double digits with more opportunities. And he qualifies at a lot of different spots. So he's kind of one of those uh, super utility markers. So Luis Ringifo is going to be my sleeper second baseman. Now, I mentioned this name on the breakout show, and you've carried him over to the sleeper list because I think it's a great spot. So at third base, yeah. is a guy in Kansas City who might be flying to the top of the batting order because uh, he's having such a good spring. We talked about him last week, Michael Garcia. So, Welsh, I want you to talk about him some more because this is a player that I kind of, you know, was alluding to. Maybe there's a breakout there. Not the biggest slugger. You look at the minor league numbers, you know, not a lot of power there, but maybe there's a little bit more pop. Maybe, again, the run score, the stolen bases, maybe all that is enough here if he makes enough contact to go from the nine hole to the one hole. And that would be huge for his fantasy value coming out of the gate in opening day. Yeah, and I want to point out, too, that 100% uh, was putting Candelari on this list. You got Candelari. This was my third base guy. You already talked about him, but he is a 1,000% all-sleeper team guy. But the other guy that was floating around, like you said, was Michael Garcia. It's not a big power play. And sometimes playing like out of traditional stats, Bogman and I did this episode on ITL about a month or month and a half ago, where it was like, what do you need out of your positions? Like, what are the average stats of the starters you need? And third base carries a lot of big power. So if you're going to take, perceivably, if he was going to be like your starter, you're missing a lot of power and you're going to have to make up in other spots. 
that marker goes down when you start to look at a player that you can put for your middle or corner infield. And that's a cool thing about Michael Garcia is he could qualify at third and short in some places. ADP is around 250. Big hard hit number last year, 50.6%. And he had over 460 uh, at bats. So that's nothing to just uh, scoff at. Problem is he hasn't gotten the ball in the air. It was around a 4% barrel percentage, but he doesn't strike out. He walks some and he steals tons of bases. He stole 23 this past year. I've seen him a bunch in camp. Looks like he's gotten bigger over at Royals mm-hmm. camp. If he is leading off, there's run RB, uh, run opportunities. There are tons of stolen base opportunities that you're getting out of position. If that power can come up, Mikel Garcia could be a low key CJ Abrams this year. If he can That's get to 12 to 15 like stolen uh, homers, yeah, and he could push 30 stolen bases and you could have that at third. Michael Garcia is one of my big sleepers and we're putting him here at third base. He's projected already on Fangraphs to lead off now. That was not the case last week when we talked about him. So there's you you look at some of these spring training lineups, keep looking at where Garcia is hitting when you get into the next week or so of spring training as Welsh alluded to. There's a player who's making a step up and he is so cheap right now. I mean, 247 yeah. Welsh. <clears throat> that's just absurd. And it's, and it's late baseman, stolen bases and it's late stolen yeah. bases just to throw out. So it's like, you you know, he qualifies at a couple of different spots. He's cheap. You're trying to chase your stolen bases. This is the guy to chase. Let's take a quick break in the action to tell you about underdog fantasy. MLB draft season is here. And the easiest place to play fantasy baseball is at Underdog Fantasy. We've already been active in their best ball format fantasy drafts, where you draft your team over 20 rounds and the best score from your team that you drafted becomes your score for each week in the MLB season. Drafts are constantly filling each and every day. So go to Underdog Fantasy right now and draft in the dinger for your share for $750,000 in prizes with first place being a cool 100 k It's only $10 to draft and the tournament closes on opening day, March 28th. So jump in now, sign up for underdog and use that promo code FPMLB. That's FPMLB to get your first deposit match up to $100. That's 10 free dinger drafts. And that promo code is FPMLB. MLB and join the underdog today and get drafting in the upcoming MLB season. And now back to the action. My guy is somebody that's been around forever. Literally. Uh, He's 142 years old. He's being drafted outside the top 200. He's at 202. He's a 21st third baseman being selected. And I get it. You're not excited about drafting Justin Turner. I get it. Okay. Last year, what did he do? He had 276, 86 runs. 96 RBI, 23 homers. Uh, He played 146 games, which is great. I know in 22, he only played 128, but he did play 151 in 2021. So when you're drafting Justin Turner, you have to realize you're probably at best getting somewhere around 130 games. Like that's kind of what your your peak is. But he continues to show you that he's still going to probably drop 20 bombs in there. He's going to drive in runs. And guess what? Guess where he's hitting Welsh in the order for the Blue Jays this year? He's slated to hit cleanup. Now I've just given you Four straight guys being drafted outside the top 200 who are hitting cleanup for their respective teams. Mitch Garver, Candelario, Drury, and Turner. Are they the most exciting guys on the planet? No. Are they going to be productive if they stay in that cleanup spot? Yeah, they are. Outside the top 200, to me, Welsh, it's a win. People are just bored. They're concerned with the age, and I get it. But he is still a live bat. You look at the second half of the year, the stats were still there. All he does is hit the baseball. That's basically all he's done his entire career after being a utility player for the Mets. And of course, only the Mets could get a guy so wrong like Justin Turner. And then he goes on to have a great career and hits 20 home runs and hits 285 every year. Only the Mets. Let's switch gears to shortstop here, Welsh. And my guy is shortstop. I'm excited about He's turning just 22. His exit velo this spring has been unbelievable. He's had a couple balls over 100. Ezekiel Tovar, who... Had some great numbers in the minor leagues. Very young player still. He got exposed last year at the major league level. Too much swing and miss. He has worked his butt off. You could see also physically a little different this year. A little bigger in the lower half in terms of the leg size. So you see like he's getting more drive on the baseball. So far he looks really good. He has crushed minor league pitching. He got exposed a little bit. And that happens sometimes with young players. But as excited as I was about Tovar last year, I'm still excited about him this year. And I feel like the bloom is off the rose. Everybody's moved on to the next thing and the next thing. And I have not. I'm going to give this guy a little bit more time. Why? Because he also plays in Colorado, folks. At any point, 
you know, Colorado is a great place to play. So if he can get right, trim down the strikeouts a little bit. So far this spring, things have gone really well for him. I had an eighth keeper in my home league. He was the last guy I kept because it was a good price. And I was like, you know what? Let me see what age 22 season brings for a guy who's playing shortstop for the Rockies. And again, you look back at the minor league track record. This was a player that showed you some elite offensive potential. So to me, this is a player that we've forgotten about and we shouldn't have. And Tovar should be a guy on your radar going at 205, the 21st shortstop. Welsh, where are you going for shortstop for your all sleeper team? Yeah, I love yours. I think like if you were literally drafting, if we were like drafting the all sleepers, like he would be the quintessential uh, sleeper shortstop this year. I'm going deeper. And I don't remember. Let me take okay. a look at this. Might be one of the deepest guys here. He's yeah, this outside is outside of 300, baby. Your 317, guy. shortstop 30. Really one of my favorite guys, especially in deeper leagues to take. Zach Neto. We're going back to the Angels. You're just looking for opportunities. Now, where he's hitting in the lineup might be a problem. There was a time where they even talked about maybe hitting him higher in and leading off. Currently, he's setting at nine. So those are going to kind of backtrack a little bit. But let me read off this. ATC projections on Zach Neto. So remember, this is a number nine hitter outside the 300s. ATC 248, 18 homers, nine stolen bases in 534 plate appearances. It's 130 games. So if you want to push that up to 150 games in a full season, that's a 2010 guy, probably into the 70s and runs. Bat X has him hitting 251, 18 homers, seven stolen bases. Playing time is still down. Neto's one of those guys. 40% hard hit rate. Barrel percentage almost into the double digits at 8.8. .8. That's a great thing to see for like a young shortstop. And we've seen this power grow. I think Neto is one of the most undervalued shortstops, especially from the counting stats. 2010 isn't just something we throw away. We're talking about that earlier. 2010 out of that middle mm -hmm. infield. He's, he's more of a traditional middle infielder. You're not going to draft him as a shortstop, but at the end of the day, he might be able to put up top 15 shortstop numbers, maybe even a little bit higher, especially if he moves higher in that lineup. But the power is becoming real. It's all about contact. He's kind of like an Anthony Volpe. He just doesn't steal as much. Neto's trending up. He's one of my sleepers. Trying to draft him wherever I can. Yeah, well, uh, these are two guys, Aneto and Tovar, that we were all excited about last year, young players coming up. And just because it didn't hit the ground running right away does not mean that you throw them away. Not at this age, not at the opportunity, and not the fact that they're both going to be starters and really nobody's going to... Well, especially, you know, it's a weird thing too, and I know this, like, we always do this thing, but like, there's guys like Carlos Correa that are sitting out there. We know exactly what we're getting from Carlos Correa, and I'm not trying to down-talk <laughs> yeah, it. 75 You're games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you're going to get 20 homers, you know, 75, 75, blah, blah, blah. But it's like there's no stolen base upside. Neto can outperform Carlos Correa just by playing throughout the year. Like there's oh, a by handful of players. Many games. Uh, yeah, there's, it, uh, yeah. There's Tovar, every opportunity that Tovar can do the same thing. Yeah, Jeremy Pena, other ones. These are guys, Jeremy Pena, yeah. Carlos Correa going ahead of both of these guys. I think Neto can easily overpass them statistically. Tovar is already kind of like designed to be there. They're, these shortstops, I think, were the big easy ones for us to pick. All right, my outfielders might have been a little easy here. In fact, my guy is at 199. The first one I'm going to talk about is Jared Duran, who uh, I know Welsh has talked about him a lot. but I, I would have like talked about him today. Outside of, but but he was already at your breakouts. Yeah, so I, I, like, it can't I be the breakout in the sleeper. Like, I mean, that maybe it can be. I don't know, but I'm with you. I'm I'm holding hands with you on the Jaron Duran thing because over 102 games last year, Duran showed you that if he plays a full season, he is a potential 1530 guy. And he hit for 295 batting average. So batting average is going to be there. So this is potentially a five category player that you're getting around pick 200 in the outfield and outfield is tough. It is not great. It's funny. Well, as I'm looking at this, we just did our underdog draft, right? If you want to see that, go check it out. We're doing a best ball draft on underdog on one of the shows we just recorded. Tovar, Drury, and uh, Jaron Duran all on that roster, all being undervalued in best ball, undervalued in regular drafts too. If you tell me this is a player that's going to score 100 runs and is going to hit at the top of the order for the Red Sox and is going to uh, be a potential player that's going to give you a 15-30 and a high batting average, why the hell is he being drafted so late? I just don't understand it. So for me, this is another player that I'm all in on and another guy too, especially in points leagues, Jung Hoo Lee of the San Francisco Giants at 212. To me, this is a guy who could challenge for the batting title. 
Again, just like Duran hitting at the top of the order. So this is a player that you want pieces of. You want to be in on Lee. He's going to be hitting at the very top of the San Francisco order. He's going to have run potential, batting average potential. He's got some pop. Is it the greatest home ballpark? No, but I think it offsets a little bit. At the same time, I think the unknown factor with Lee is scaring some people off. And I don't think it should, but you watch this guy play and you watch him in spring. He's flashing some power in the spring so far. This is one of these guys where spring training matters. Well, we always say this, like spring training doesn't matter except for the guys that it matters for. And Lee's one of these guys for me. I wanted to see how he's hitting some major league pitching. What does he look like here? Is he overmatched? And the answer is no, he's not overmatched at all. So Lee and Duran are two guys that are going late in the outfield that I love. Now you've picked two guys that are going even later, which I love. One of which I need you to sell me on because I'm almost there with the first one. And the second one, I think, is one that's going to blow a lot of people's minds. So let's talk about your two sleeper outfielders for 24. Yeah, so there have been two late outfielders I'm targeting in every draft. There's lots of outfielders I like this year. We've talked about, done videos like Riley Green and stuff. When we go later, there's two guys. Jaron Duran, who you mentioned, and Jared Kelnick. So double J's, double, double J. J, not Jeff Jarrett, but Jared Duran. And Hopefully Jaren less bad Durant. country music, but yeah, yes. Jared Kelnick. Uh, Jared Kelnick is the guy. So last season, Kelnick was kind of off to a, you know, we had this whole big thing, 11 homers through uh, 300 at bats, hit around 250. He was stealing a bunch, 11 stolen bases in that first run. Then he gets hurt, comes back. Power zap, stop stealing. He was hitting for contact. He had 288 post All Star break in around 60 at bats, uh, which I think then he got hurt after that. Actually, maybe because maybe I mixed that up. But either way, that power kind of zapped. Batting average went away. We saw who Jaren, Jared Kelnick was. And you're now going into a ballpark where left handed hitters thrive way more. I mean, he was in Seattle, one of the worst ballpark factors out there. I think it's a top 10 ballpark factor for left-handed hitters for Jared Kelnick, who has been barreling the ball better. He's been stealing bases. The strikeouts are a problem. That's always something that we've got to consider. But a 264 expected batting average overall is great. 112 Mm -hmm. max EV, solid. Double-digit barrel percentage, good. He's getting the ball in the air. It was in the 10s. These are things that you can build off of into a huge, big offensive lineup in uh, Atlanta that is going to support him overall. Hitting six or seven in Atlanta is like that Dodger situation. Is that point? Yeah. You drop him into the Braves offense. Like you got to be a real jabroni not to be good in the Braves offense. Like you're going to produce something. Just just make some contact for goodness sake. But uh, this is a really interesting move. Keep talking about Kalnick. I, I love yeah, this. And- and also, I mean, he destroyed fastballs last year, 92 EV, hit 292 with a 282 expected batting average. Though the batting average wasn't great against breaking and off speed, the expected batting average, 239, 267, was good. He's becoming a better hitter. I think he's going 2020 this year. That's where I think Kelnick is going to go. You're going to get more offensive opportunities, even hitting six, seven, or eight in Atlanta because that offense turns over even more and you're out of the platoon stuff. So I love Jared Kelnick. He's one of my main targets, stolen bases power. The other guy is a guy that might get some leadoff opportunity or hitting high in the op- in the lineup as well. One of the deepest guys in here, well out the side, outside the top 300. And it's not Riley Green with the Tigers. It's Parker Meadows. This is another 2020 guy. Uh, I say a lot of the, some of the same stats sometimes that could be annoying to people, but it's things you're looking for big breakouts. 9% barrel percentage. You're closing into the double digit percentage. Gets the ball in the air. Last year, he had an 18 degree launch angle. It's one of the highest probably for any outfielder, but one of the highers in the league. Expected batting average 250. Hard hit percentage moving up a little bit. This is a solid bat and he is a power speed threat. I actually think he could steal more bases uh, than hit homers, but if you get 15-25 out of a full season, I think that is in the cards. I think if he plays a full season, he's going to put up 20 stolen bases, and I'm going to take a look here um, over on, we'll do ATC, we'll do our buddy Ariel Cohen, where we've got a great episode here if you guys want to check out. And for Mm -hmm. Parker Meadows, in 123 games, Uh, they have 15 stolen bases and 13 homers with a low batting average of 230. So you can start to project out if he plays 150, you're going to close in on a 2020. So both of the guys I picked here are 2020 potential players. And that's what I'm looking out of a lot of my depth in the outfield. I'm trying to get big power bats early on as much as I can. And then Jared and Duran, Jared Kelnick, 
Parker Meadows. These are some of my favorite outfielders in those five outfielder formats to target. Things starting to turn around for the Tigers a little bit, Welsh, after all these years. We'll bit. see. All right. The starting pitchers, Welsh, who are the two names that you're targeting as sleepers in 24? All right. Uh, so number one, I've got Nick Pavetta, who I, I think I've talked a, a little bit about. Uh, a little 31, bit, yeah, yeah 31.2%. K percentage from July 1st on Pavetta had, I think it was the number one K percentage and uh, he had the highest on the season, highest on the season with increase of a starting pitcher overall with increase and Pavetta has had a good spring. We're seeing uh velo upticks. Bodie's there making that team even better. He went a full mile per hour up on the fastball. I think what they're going to be doing with pitchers overall has been phenomenal. Pavetta could hurt us, I suppose, in the long term. But the K percentage was like elite without any crazy walk uh, issues. And it might have actually even been the K minus walk percentage, which was really high from July 1st on. He was an elite strikeout option, and now he's going to get the full throws of it. Hopefully he stays healthy. I think he's a big sleeper pick and his uh, ADP at 175 has actually been moving up, but he's pitcher 51 it's top 30 SP upside with the strikeouts. My other one we've talked, we talked actually a decent amount, I think in the underdog draft was Taj Bradley. Mm -hmm. And Taj Bradley with that confidence back, some uptick in spring with the cutter working again. I think Taj Bradley is in line for all the innings that he can have this year. And I think he's, he might be the best pitcher, like overall pitcher, especially from a stuff perspective in that rotation and given the full confidence and without many restrictions, I think Taj Bradley is going to have a big breakout this year. So Taj and Pavetta are my two SP sleepers. Two really good ones. Uh, definitely in there. And Bradley, um, uh, that's another one too. I'm buying back in, you know, he was an elite prospect last year. We were all excited about, we were telling everybody run to the waiver wire, spend what you need to get him. It didn't work out. Okay. That doesn't mean he's a bad pitcher. It means he's a young pitcher that still has to learn. And it seems like he's been humbled a little bit. Seems like he's put the work in the offseason so far this spring, showing you some much better versions of himself. The velocity, I don't know if you saw this, Welsh. He was sitting at 96, 96.4. That's yeah. a pretty and he was 96.1 last year. So he's yeah. upticking a little bit. Uh, I mean, he got hit hard last year, but I think that's something that decreased. Like every single pitch he threw had a 90 or higher exit velocity against, but... That's rookie. That's rookie pitching. I think with the tutelage, I'll be very curious to see what changes happen. The cutter was the big, like, weird thing. Uh, I'll be curious to see if the split finger comes up because last mm -hmm. year it had the highest whiff percentage, over 40%. If we see the split finger uh, trend that's going on, if we see the, maybe that overtake the cutter a little bit more, I think the Rays are going to turn him into a bigger strikeout pitcher Agreed. this season, and that's going to be the focus. And I think that's what's going to make him exceptionally better. I do too. I'm excited about Tosh Bradley. I'm also excited about my two pitchers on the list at 203 and 222. The first one's Brian Wu of the Seattle Mariners, a, a pitcher with a live arm who had a, a, a spotty record, I think, at times in some of the college baseball. But you've seen what Seattle's been able to do out of him. And in 18 games last year, 87 innings, 93 strikeouts for him. He's got to trim the walk rate just a little bit. If he can do that, that's great. A 4-2-1 ERA. Okay. You know, it's again rookie stuff as we were alluding to before but a one two one whip and i think that Wu is one of these pitchers you start to see the kind of competitor he is he's in the back end of this rotation it's a deep rotation there's no pressure on the kid all he's got to do is just go out there every fifth day give the seattle mariners a chance to win and i told you already in the beginning of the show i like the mariners so if i like the mariners i'm in on the mariners i want the mariners to you know continue to use this rotation to get not even into the playoffs but I think they can go all the world, all the way to the World Series and maybe even win it this year. I really do. And Aaron Savali is the other guy in Tampa going at 222. If you look at Aaron Savali, it's eerily similar of some of the earmarks of what we've seen time and time again in Tampa, where they take a guy who's kind of feels like a middling pitcher who at times shows you better versions of himself. He comes to Tampa and all of a sudden you get the best version of him. If you look at Savali's recent seasons, you see a guy who is, you know, kind of under 9K per nine, somewhere around that eight and a half range, eight range, nothing blown away. ERA floating around four. Go back and look at Zach Eflin before last year. It's pretty much the same guy, statistically speaking. 
Can the Rays be the team that gets the most out of Aaron Savali? I think the answer is 100% yes. Every year, we've started to get smarter and smarter to this Welsh, where we say, oh, who are the Rays signing this offseason? That guy? Yeah, well, let me put him on the sleeper list, because Zach Eflin was on this list last year, I believe, or one of these lists we talk about, hey, sleeper pitchers, take a shot on Eflin. Why? Because Tampa signed him. And I'm going to go back down to this well again with Savali. What's kind of funny about it is like, these three pitch, like, I'm going to throw Pepio in there too. Pepio, Savali, and Bradley. They're all just cheap. I don't hate the idea of like taking them all and what? figuring out because it is kind of weird. Like you can't just throw all the Rays pitchers in and be like, hey, they're going to do this and this. But the Rays have a system of picking. Like Pepio had some big stuff plus numbers fastball. You have you've seen Savali and what he can do with some of his off speed stuff. And then it's like you get one of the best organizations that manipulates some of these players and has their hand into pitching development. And they've taken these pieces in. All of these guys could be great in different ways. Savali, from a command mm -hmm. perspective, Pepio looks like a big strikeout guy. Bradley might be the best combination between them. It's just not bad to bet on. The same thing you did with the Mariners as well. You can't get a Mariners pitcher really for cheap, except for mm -hmm. Wu and Bryce Miller. And I wouldn't hate you for taking both of them. Rays, Mariners, the cheap options that are going to be out there, I think those are great just bets. Now, it's tough if you're going to like do a big capital on drafting a bunch of them, but if let's just arguably say somehow you were able to get two of these Rays pitchers and two of those Mariner pitchers, you're probably giving yourself at least a 50% chance of a player yeah. that is going to blow past the cost Agreed. of what you put into them. It's it's you know again it's like buying more tickets to the fifty fifty raffle you know it's just like it's gonna be there. Well, Somebody's I'm not sure that's the. Have you ever known a single won, human being that's won it? No, you didn't. Once. No, I you have. didn't. I've got proof. I got the tickets. At a minor, somewhere. no, you at a minor league game. Somewhere. You did not win at like a. a well, you know who's game. winning in life, Welsh. No, you Anybody who watches our fantasy fest, which is coming up, our third annual. Fantasy Pros MLB Fantasy Fest is happening right here on the channel on Wednesday, the 13th from 4 to 8 p.m. Eastern, four-hour live stream, me, the Welsh, you got Eno Saris, you've got Scott Pianowski, you got Steve Gardner, you got an amazing group of guests who are going to be joining us and more to break down the 2024 fantasy baseball landscape. We've also got a mock draft at the end. And if you can't join us live, that's okay. It's all going to be up on the YouTube channel. But regardless, subscribe to the YouTube channel. That's what you got to do. Ring that bell till it goes ding for notifications. And by the way, if you're going back and watching it on demand, as the kids like to say, or if you're going to watch it uh, live, you can ask your questions. Hopefully you get some of them answered here on the show. But if you are a subscriber of Fantasy Pros, if you are dropping your comments like a good boy and girl, we're giving away something very cool. The Ultimate Fantasy Baseball Championship belt from Trophy Smack. Somebody's going to win this bad boy. It's amazing. All you got to do, again, subscribe to Fantasy Bros MLB, the greatest baseball YouTube channel on the planet, and comment on a video. That's it. That's all you got to do. And don't forget to ring the bell till it goes ding, and you could win the Trophy Smack ultimate symbol of fantasy baseball supremacy. And remember, leading off live is going to be right around the corner. So subscribe to Fantasy Bros MLB. Hang out with us at Fest Live or watch it back or both. And that's all you got to do to win some free stuff. The Ultimate Fantasy Baseball Championship belt, courtesy of our good friends at Trophy Smack Welsh. Let's get to our relief pitchers. That's all that's left here on our list. So for me, this one's easy. Uh, sometimes, you know me, I don't like to pay for saves. So if saves just get away from me, Jose Leclerc is the guy in Texas that got the bulk of them last year. Texas is still going to be a very competitive team. And if Leclerc isn't the guy, and as the manager said, well, we haven't put names and we don't want to put labels on guys right now. We're not going to label anybody, anything. Okay, fine. Well, Robertson's there too. So it's going to be one of these guys. So you take Robertson with your very last pick and you take Leclerc late and you've got all the saves in Texas. Well, I think it's a very easy equation. Where are you going here for your saves? Because the name on your list is the one I was going to put on mine, but this one you nab before me. Yeah, so... Like, I agree with what you said about closers in general. I like the cheap save guys. Leclerc would be a player. But, you know, if we're talking like sleepers and we're talking upside, Matt Brash would have been a player I would have picked if he didn't have this arm injury. The other obvious one is a guy that's qualifying as a starting pitcher right now, and it's Mason Miller. So that's who you were alluding to because of this insanely big fastball. And the team said... They want to commit to him being like a reliever this year. They don't want to hand him the job to be the closer from day one. I think they want him to kind of prove and work it. But this is a guy, they kind of keep telling us these things with Mason Miller, and then it just, bam, it explodes. I mean, we're talking about a triple digits fastball pitcher 
who really, I mean, he throws a cutter. Cutter and sliders can kind of be the same. It's kind of a slider fastball guy. Quintessential classic closer that they've already said they want to put him in. Here's the only problem. How many opportunities are the A's actually going to have to save? That's the bigger question. But when given those opportunities, Mason Miller is going to thrive with it. He's going to strike out guys. He might have a couple blowups. He is the closer of closers. Yeah. And if the opportunity happens early, Mason Miller might save 25 to 30 games and he would be a top 10 closer. So you want to talk about a closer sleeper? I think he is the number one quintessential player, but there is risk in this pick because it he is. could just be middle middle relief. You know what? I don't think he's going to be middle relief. I think to keep him healthy, the best thing to do is give him that clean ninth inning. And if the A's were a competitive team, I'd be more concerned because I don't want Mason Miller working three or four days in a row, closing out games. And the yeah, A's aren't winning three or four games in a row. That's not going to be no. a problem. So in a lot of ways, it's kind of the best case scenario. Make him the closer. He's on a bad team. One or two appearances a week. Okay, great. It's a great opportunity for Mason Miller to be healthy, be productive. I think it's the best case scenario for him. So just to recap here, here's our all sleeper teams. Welsh has Wilson Contreras at catcher, Christian Encarnacion Strand at first, Luis Rangifo at second, Michael Garcia at uh, third base, Zach Neto at third, excuse me, at shortstop, the outfielders, Jared Kelnick, Parker Meadows, then Pavetta and Bradley, uh, the pitchers, and Mason Miller at closer. I've got Mitch Garver, cleanup <laughs> at catcher. Imer Candelario, clean up at first base. Brennan Jury, clean up at second base. Justin Turner, clean up hitter at third base. See, I love a theme. Ezekiel Tovar, it's short. Jaron Duran in the outfield along with Jung Hu Lee. Brian Wu, Aaron Savali, Jose LeClerc, a.k.a. anybody in Texas. So take David Robertson with your last pick. And again, you get all the saves. And you don't have to worry about spending any free agent budget as long as your bench is big enough. But we want to hear from you. Who are your sleepers in 2024? Drop your comments below and you just might win yourself an incredible Trophy Smack Ultimate Fantasy Baseball Championship belt, which looks pretty cool. And don't forget to join us for Fantasy Fest Wednesday the 13th right here on Fantasy Bros MLB. Subscribe, like the video, and have a great day, everybody. That'll do it for us. But the story of the game goes on. For the Welsh, I'm Joey P. We'll see you next time, kids.